Hello, my name is Jen Dubina and I am a museum educator at the National Museum of the United States Army. Today you are joining me for a field trip to learn more about African American soldiers during World War II. I work at the National Army Museum in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. The museum tells the history of America's oldest military service, the United States Army, using the stories and objects used by soldiers. During today's field trip, we'll be visiting the museum's Global War Gallery. On your screen, I'm going to play you a video to show you what that museum gallery looks like. And on your screen, you can see some of the artifacts, like the museum's Bofors gun, which is on display in that gallery, as well as the Sherman tank and a variety of other objects in the museum. Today's talk will focus on World War II. Before we get started, who is familiar with World War II? What have you studied about this conflict before? Today we are going to learn about how African American soldiers' courageous service during World War II led to the integration of the military, a first step of the Civil Rights Movement. When you usually think about the modern Civil Rights Movement taking place, when do you think that happens? We usually think of World War II and the Civil Rights Movement as two separate events. Many people think of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s or 1960s with the March on Washington in 1963 or the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. But in reality, the Civil Rights Movement has been a long struggle that's coincided with many periods in American history. Today we're going to talk about how African Americans have often had to make a way out of no way. Have any of you heard this phrase before? making a way out of no way. What do you think that might mean? This is a phrase that was used by African Americans who faced discrimination or were treated unfairly because of the color of their skin. In the South following the Civil War, African Americans were confronted with things like racism, discrimination, and segregation. So when I say segregation, what does that mean? It means keeping people separate based on the color of their skin. So we're talking about keeping white and black people separated at this time. Following Reconstruction, segregation impacted almost every aspect of American life in the South. So what did segregation look like on the eve of World War II? It meant that schools, businesses, entertainment venues, and churches were all segregated based on race. With the segregated facilities, there were often disparities or differences between the services that were offered to black and white citizens. So black Americans had to literally make their own way out of the obstacles of racism and segregation. So when they were denied the right to attend colleges, they formed their own universities, like historically black universities and colleges. When they were barred from shopping or eating in stores or businesses that catered to whites, they formed their own businesses, like some that you see on your screen here. There's people like Madam C.J. Walker who created her own beauty industry. They created their own businesses in towns like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Even though black Americans lived under segregation, they continued to enlist in the Army. Take a look at the photograph on your screen. What do you notice about this object? Is there anything that stands out to you? Does anyone know what this is an image of? This is an image of a shoulder sleeve insignia for the 92nd Infantry Division. Soldiers wear patches to identify the unit that they serve with, kind of like a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout patch. So this would have been worn on the left sleeve of a soldier's uniform to identify what unit they served in. Some of you might have also noticed the buffalo. In this case, the buffalo indicates the 92nd Division's nickname, the Buffalo Soldiers. Buffalo Soldiers was the term used for all black units that served on the western frontier in the late 1800s. When they weren't fighting, the Buffalo Soldiers built roads and telegraph lines, guarded stagecoaches and mail routes, escorted supply trains and survey parties, and went on scouting patrols. This patch represents the long tradition of African American participation in the U.S. Army. Black soldiers have served proudly and courageously in every conflict since the Revolutionary War. Some of the images you see on the screen highlight that service. Not only did the Buffalo Soldiers serve in the American West following the Civil War, but they also served in the war with Spain, as you can see in the image on the left side of your screen. 
Yet, their military service often mirrored American society. And what that means is that like a mirror, things that happen in the military are reflected and are the same things happening in American society. Following the Civil War, paralleling the rise in segregation, black soldiers who enlisted were assigned to all black units and given different roles than white soldiers. Simply put, the army was segregated. Let's take a look at an image that's displayed in the museum. Take a closer look at the photograph on your screen. You can find this in our Army and Society Gallery. What do you notice about this image? Can you tell who the people are in it? What are they wearing? And is there anything else that stands out to you about the people in this photograph? One thing that you might notice right away is that this is a group of soldiers because they're all wearing the same uniform. And if you look closely, you can see that they are highly decorated because they're wearing awards that are pinned to the lapel of their coat. You might also have noticed that they're standing on a dock. So this indicates that they are coming or going from somewhere. These are soldiers that are coming from overseas. And you may also have noticed that this appears to be an entirely all black unit. These soldiers are from the 369th Infantry Regiment known as the Harlem Hellfighters. During World War I, they were the first black unit shipped overseas. However, once they arrived, the Army assigned them to unloading ships and cleaning latrines rather than a role in combat. Eventually, though, they were assigned to the French Army because white American officers didn't want black and white men fighting together. The French didn't share this racist attitude and gladly accepted the help of the 369th. And this is where they earned the nickname the Hellfighters because during their 191 days at the front, no man was captured and no ground was taken. But their success came at a price. Their unit suffered the worst casualties of any American regiment during World War I. And in France, they were treated like heroes and were awarded the French Croix de Guerre, which is the equivalent of the American Medal of Honor. And this is what you see them wearing on the lapel in the photograph. During World War I, black Americans had hoped that their military service would reverse racism at home and lead to full equality. However, despite their heroic efforts on the battlefield, they were not treated like heroes. Segregation remained at home and therefore in the army. Black Americans experienced segregation in almost all areas of life. The images on your screen here offer just a glimpse into some of those areas, like segregated taxis, waiting rooms, and laundromats. In fact, following World War I, there was an increase in violence against black Americans by groups like the Ku Klux Klan and others, and race riots that occurred throughout the country in places like New York, Detroit, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now this brings us to World War II. At the outset of the war, the United States asked Americans to fill their military ranks. This led some African Americans who were subjected to unequal treatment to question the government's call for black soldiers to enlist in the armed forces. One man, James G. Thompson, captured those feelings in a letter to the editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a widely circulated black newspaper. Let's look closer at Mr. Thompson's letter to the editor. Mr. Thompson writes, being an American of dark complexion and some 26 years, these questions flashed through my mind. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Is this the kind of America I know worth defending? The V for victory sign is being displayed prominently for victory over aggression, slavery, and tyranny. Then let we colored Americans adopt the double VV for a double victory. The first V for victory over our enemies from without and the second for victory over our enemies from within. What does Mr. Thompson mean by half American? What is he trying to say here? Mr. Thompson is referring to the fact that black people in the United States were not treated equally, hence half American. Prior to the war, nearly 80% of the black population lived in the South under Jim Crow laws that institutionalized segregation. And on the eve of World War II, blacks carried an unemployment rate twice that of white Americans and a median income that was a third of the average family. 
Additionally, between 1918 and 1941, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People recorded at least 544 lynchings of blacks, although recent estimates have determined that that number would be even higher. Mr. Thompson continues, I love America and I'm willing to die for the America I know will someday become a reality. He goes on further to say that black Americans should adopt the double VV or double victory. What do you think that means? Thompson's letter to the editor sparked what came to be known as the double victory campaign. For the double victory over discrimination at home and victory over fascism abroad. The double V victory campaign was very popular. There were double V baseball games, gardens, war bond drives, and beauty pageants. There was even a double V hairstyle called the doubler, as well as clothing and accessories. And on the screen here, you can see some images in support of the double V campaign. The image on the left is from a newspaper advocating for both democracy at home and abroad. And the image on the right is a handkerchief that was made to support the double V campaign. The campaign worked. African Americans answered America's call for military service. Almost 1.2 million African Americans served in the military during World War II. At the start of the war, African American soldiers were assigned to segregated units like those soldiers in this image. In addition, most were excluded from combat units. This meant that black soldiers filled roles in support and were kept from the front lines. The soldiers in this photograph were part of the 666 Quartermaster Truck Battalion. This unit took part in what came to be known as the Red Ball Express, which would become the lifeline of the entire U.S. Army in Europe. These soldiers were responsible for getting supplies to the front lines. Starting in August 1944, the truck started rolling seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and traveled close to 800 miles round trip. If you take a look at the image on your screen, the map demonstrates the routes that the soldiers took. Following the Normandy invasion, they left France and headed east with the rest of the army. Now, while these soldiers weren't on the front line, the work they performed was incredibly dangerous. The soldiers drove through enemy territory and were under the threat of enemy fire constantly. They couldn't drive faster than 25 miles per hour which is slower than a school bus drives in a school zone, and they drove in the dark with their headlights off to prevent detection from the enemy. And they had to keep sandbags in their vehicles to weigh them down to prevent against mine blast. They were called the lifeline of the army because soldiers couldn't survive without the food, clothing, and equipment that they were bringing to keep fighting. And it wasn't just the male soldiers who answered the country's call for service. Women participated in the Women's Army Corps, which was also segregated based on race. The image of the soldier that you see on your screen is from the 6888th Central Postal Battalion, nicknamed 6888. They were the only all African American, all female unit to be sent overseas during the war, and they were in charge of keeping mail flowing to nearly 7 million soldiers in the European theater of operations. When they arrived in England in 1945, they encountered the monumental task of delivering a backlog of millions of packages and letters, as well as incoming mail. Letters and packages were stacked high to the ceiling of an airplane hangar. Some mail had been there for nearly two years. The wax worked in three shifts, seven days a week, processing and delivering the mail. They cleared the backlog in three months and were then sent to France where they continued the same work. If you look at the image on your screen, you can see just how large this task was that the soldiers faced. All of the duffel bags shown in the hangar are filled with undelivered mail. The next image shows some of the soldiers from the 6888. So as we have seen, these two examples, while African-American soldiers contributed to the Allied victory, they were excluded from combat roles on the front line. Black soldiers believed that if they were given access to these jobs, their contributions would be noticed by white Americans and they would be treated more fairly at home. So they demanded the right to serve in combat roles. At home, civil rights leaders took up the call and put pressure on President Roosevelt and the Army to allow black soldiers the opportunity to fight in combat roles. 
Civil rights leaders threatened a large march on Washington to protest and spotlight the discrimination faced by black soldiers. Have you heard of another march on Washington before? The negative publicity associated with this type of march while the country was fighting a war against Nazism and fascism led army leaders to acquiesce and begin to open combat roles for African American soldiers. African American soldiers eagerly filled combat roles to further advance the concept of double victory. Like these soldiers, pictured on your screen, who fought in the European theater in France and were members of the 761st Tank Battalion, who were nicknamed the Black Panthers. Their motto was come out fighting, and they did. They spent 183 days, or nearly half a year, fighting on the front line, and they are credited with liberating 30 towns in Belgium, France, and Germany. The 761st received the Presidential Unit Citation for Extraordinary Bravery in 1978. Through their participation in combat roles, African American soldiers continued to make vital contributions to the Allied victory. Since the museum's motto is every soldier has a story, let's take a look at the experiences of a soldier who served in a combat unit during World War II in the European theater. Lieutenant John R. Fox served with the 92nd Infantry Division as a forward observer. A forward observer is sometimes called a spotter and they are responsible for radioing in coordinates for artillery fire. On December 26, 1944, Fox volunteered to stay behind in the Italian village of Soma Colonia while elements of his unit retreated. Stationed on the second floor of a house, Fox continued to radio artillery fire on the advancing German soldiers. The German soldiers continued to advance and became closer and closer to Fox's position but Fox continued to radio in artillery fire that came perilously close to his location until he ordered artillery to be fired directly onto his position. Fox knew his chances of survival were small, so he ordered headquarters to strike his position, ordering fire it when commanders questioned the strike. Fox was presumed killed in action after the firing. His sacrifices gave U.S. forces time to galvanize a counterattack and retake the village. In 1982, Fox was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, which was upgraded to the Medal of Honor in 1996. It was the direct result of heroic actions of black soldiers like Lieutenant Fox and so many others that impacted civil rights at home. Influenced by the bravery of black soldiers, President Harry Truman said, we've got to do something. And what does he mean by that? Like World War I veterans 20 years earlier, black soldiers returned home hoping that their wartime service would bring equality. However, returning soldiers were greeted with racial discrimination and violence. President Truman said, whatever my inclinations as a native of Missouri might have been, I shall fight to end evils like this. President Truman wanted to make change quickly. Fearing that congressional action would take too long, and looking ahead to his upcoming re-election campaign, Truman used executive action. And on July 28, 1948, he issued Executive Order 9981, which stated that, for all who serve in our country's defense, it is hereby declared that there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons without regard to race, color, or national origin. When asked if the order meant an end to segregation, the president simply stated, yes. This executive order ended the practice of segregated units in the United States Army, and his executive order was the first step in ending segregation throughout the country, and it occurred years before the Supreme Court ruling Brown v. the Board of Education. Now, it takes a while for these types of things to be implemented, so segregation in the Army didn't end overnight, but by 1951, all units within the Army were integrated. How do the soldiers' actions impact civil rights, and how can they be felt today? As a result of Executive Order 9981 and the brave actions of African American soldiers, the armed forces, including the Army, were desegregated. That desegregation opened the ranks to all soldiers, including African Americans. Thank you for listening to the talk today. 
to learn more about the experiences of black soldiers during World War II. I hope that you were able to recognize the challenges that were faced by African American soldiers and understand how their service contributed to Executive Order 9981 and the integration of the Army. To learn more about the museum and to contact us, visit our website or find us on social media.